Hello. Welcome to SciShow Talk Show. It's that day on SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today, we've got Dr. Orion Berryman. Did I get that right? Nailed it. <laughs> From uh, <laughs> Assistant Professor of Chemistry <clears throat> at the University of Montana. You have a group, the Orion Berryman Group. And we have talked to people from your group before. It's pretty cool to have a group. Like, it's, how does that happen? Do, like, it's like a bunch of groupies following you around. No, yeah. No, it's like a <laughs> just uh, unto, you know graduate students doing your bidding. <laughs> exactly. That's like slave labor. Basically. That's way better. Yeah. Than groupies. <laughs> do crystallography for me. Make a molecule. <laughs> that's, Go. That's right. <laughs> Um, Certain benefits, anyway. Yeah, you've uh, you've littered my coffee table here with well, molecules. Yeah, sorry about that. No, it's uh, it's fine. I I, I accept. Um, you so you're doing organic chemistry. Yeah, we call it physical organic chemistry, chemistry or supramolecular chemistry. Supra. Supra. Yeah. Molecular. So the chemistry outside of a molecule. Wait a second, because it isn't all, all chemistry just molecules. Yeah, so I mean, typically when you think of organic chemistry, a lot of organic chemists construct molecules or figure mm -hmm. out efficient ways to synthesize or make a molecule. And that's really important for the applications that, that we do. But we're also interested in once we make that molecule, uh, can we study it and learn how it interacts with other molecules? So, I mean, isn't that just all chemistry? Yeah, I so, I so what's... I don't mean to harsh your buzz. No, that's really great. But what's, molecules interacting with each other. Yeah, so that's the really cool... <laughs> part of being a supramolecular chemist is that you can apply research in supramolecular chemistry to any chemistry field. Yeah. And uh, you've got these 3D printed molecules here. And these all look basically like the same thing, except that, so these two are the same except for whatever this is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what this is. <laughs> what is that? That's perenate, which is an anion. So this thing that you're pointing at is, is important because we synthesize the rest of the molecule. Right. This is just a model of it, obviously. Molecules themselves are, are much smaller. <laughs> I, think, I think we were all there at least. You said your chemistry was really rusty, so I thought I'd start there. Thanks, good. <laughs> Appreciate it. So we're interested in targeting or selectively sensing mm -hmm. these anionic portions or uh, anions. Mm -hmm. And so how this molecule interacts with these things, chloride in this case, or perenate in this and case perenate, is important. And perenate, no idea what that is. Perenate is a tetrahedral oxoanion. There's four oxygens okay. around a metal. And so why people are interested in perenate is because it's very uh, structurally and electronically similar to pertechnitate, which is radioactive and nobody likes to play okay. with pertechnitate. So we use that as a as a surrogate or a model for protectinate, okay. basically. And why does why do people want to do chemistry with protectinate? Nope. They want to know how you know it, it can be a contaminant. So if okay. you could um, okay. remove Pull radioactive it out stuff. Yep, okay. Exactly. And so you're creating all of this this whole thing except for the anion, and then using it using this to influence the anion. Yeah. So we'll study how you know how strongly we can quantify how strongly this molecule once we've made it interacts with different anions. And that gives us a sense of how efficient our molecule is at, could be at extracting a contaminant or, or something of interest. So basically getting, creating a place that an anion wants to be. Right. But a negatively charged yeah. ion of some yeah. kind. Yeah, so we're essentially like uh, molecular architects where we're trying to design a molecule to complement the size and shape and electronics of another molecule. So this is, this is a pretty or active anion. area of research for you right now? Yeah, it is. Because I'm assuming because there's, there's only... Uh, four things here on this desk. Three of three of them are this. <laughs> well, so this happened to be, you know, when we were interested in figuring out if we could 3D print our ah, crystal okay. structures. So this yeah. happened to be a, one of those new structures that we had. So we just send a bunch of different okay, cool. samples out for printing. So you're, you're making stuff frequently, <clears throat> new molecules. My students are. I, I unfortunately don't you're get just supervised much now. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sad um, face. Does this have a name, this structure that you've built? Are you trying to figure out the IUPAC name in your head right now? Because that's going to be a really long. <laughs> it is going to be. I would have to go to, to uh, Kim Draw or something and yeah. look it up. But. Uh -huh. So what, what this molecule taught us really, so this was kind of our first generation receptor. Okay. And this taught us that our design was a, probably more flexible than we wanted it to be. So if you flexible really- Flexible like physically? Well, uh, it has lots of conformational- um, Like it can bend and wiggle and- Yeah, it can yeah. move in a lot of different conformations more than we yeah. wanted to. Yeah. If you really want to design something that's very selective for something, one way to do that is to make it pre-organized or to already be complementing mm -hmm. the shape of whatever you're trying to target. And so this design taught us that this, these alkyne bonds, these carbon-carbon triple bonds here, mm -hmm. you know, you have essentially energetically free rotation around that bond. And so this... I these do, I, so, but double bonds don't have that. 
what triple bonds do? The single bonds uh, related gotcha. uh, adjacent to them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, so you're getting so you're getting wiggles. <laughs> yeah. So basically, what this led us to creating more rigid molecules so that we could complement uh, other things and make them more pre-organized. Mm -hmm. And then that led us to building larger structures like these molecules over here. That are. So basically, these this, are just. This is a big old thing. Yeah. So this is an extension of of this piece, this little binding motif. We've essentially just elongated it, mm -hmm. and so that we have nine aromatic rings instead of three. And, and so, then this is when you do the crystallography. It, this is what it looks like. Yeah, so. that was the big surprise for us. Yeah. So we take one of these strands, which has three different binding sites now, and we dissolve in solution, and something really complicated happened. We could tell by NMR. Uh, spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't tell what that was until we got a crystal structure of it and it turned out to be this really cool triple helix binding around two iodides. That's kind of the some of the power of x-ray crystallography is it gives mm -hmm. us uh, atomic resolution of um, structures. Yeah. And then we can go back and say now we have the coordinates and we know the symmetry of this molecule. We can go look at our other data and say wow that really does fit the the symmetry that we see in the crystal structure as well. Right. So somewhere in there, there's your iodides. Yeah, so if you look in this, there's like a pore here, and you can mm -hmm. see that middle atom here. That's an iodide, and there's one on the other side. Okay. And so we think now we've done some preliminary studies where these ions are fluxing in and out. And mm -hmm. so this basically does looks like an, a small ion channel. So that's one of the areas of research we're pursuing yeah. is extending this into a larger structure. Yeah, I mean, my, my background, if it is that anymore, is in biochemistry. And so when I think about this, like th there's obviously lots of biological enzymes in your body, mm -hmm. in my body, that do similar things that are like when you need like an oxygen or like an OH group, mm -hmm. you need, like, need a place for it to sort of go to increase its energy level so that, you know, a reaction can proceed. Lots of things like this, but obviously much bigger than this. Right. Yeah. So when biochemists, you know, we're a very collaborative university. When mm -hmm. I talk to other professors that are biochemists, they kind of look at our molecules and they say, oh, that's cute. <laughs> it's super cute. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is adorable. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's symmetrical. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, super cute. Uh, whereas, yeah, this is this is getting to more what biochemistry is. They still consider is. that yeah, cute. It's, yeah, this is like tiny still. Yeah. But like, you know, it's a messy clump of yeah. lumpy stuff that's going to be moving around a lot. But and to me, it's... Even when you do crystallize it, like you might not know what it looks like in solution. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But to me, it's fascinating because for three of these strands to come together and bind two iodides in a very specific um, mm -hmm. higher order structure is really pretty amazing. The things that have to come together to do that is, you know, there's over 50, I think, 58 pi stacking interactions that are contributing to the energetics of, of the stability of this, as well as these very directional halogen bonds. And that's what we're kind of excited about. Those halogen bonds force the assembly of this complicated structure rather than a simple one to one mm -hmm. binding like we would see in these more simpler cases. Right, but it's still functional. Uh, so are, are you looking <clears throat> at catalysis here, or are you looking at cleaning up radioactive spills? Yes, and yeah. yeah. Okay. So the smaller stuff we originally wanted, we're looking at building catalysts and anion sensors based on halogen bonding interactions. Anion and, sensors. Yeah. So, so just telling can, you stuff's there? Yeah, so if you could determine the concentration of, say, protectinate in the solution, mm -hmm. it could be of value. To, yeah, to someone. Quickly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, to someone. Yeah. We're not going to say who. Maybe not somebody walking down the street. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So you, you were talking about pi stacking. I don't know what that is. Yeah, so that's the, the wheelhouse of supermolecular chemistry are these non covalent interactions yeah. or how molecules interact with each other. And so pi stacking is, is one of the types of non covalent interactions. And it occurs when you have something with pi electrons or two things with pi electrons. Oh, gotcha. And then in certain orientations, that can be an attractive interaction. Yeah. And so all these small interactions in concert can lead to really a large enthalpic or large energetic uh, contribution to the stability of the structure. Sort of like base level chemistry, you're usually talking about covalent bonds, but also like hydrogen bonds, which are non-covalent and, and are <clears throat> a huge deal when you're figuring out the structure of a protein. Uh -huh. But then you've got a lot of other kinds yeah. as well. So I teach, you know, sophomore organic chemistry and we talk about synthesis and making molecules. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of just brush on hydrogen yeah. bonds and yeah. try to explain the importance of those. But there's a whole nother a whole world of a whole really cool world out there that of, of non covalent bonds. That if you really delve into, you know, into the chemistry major, you get to experience these things. So when did you gradu graduate it. from when did you finish your undergrad? Uh, I I graduated in two thousand three. Okay. Yeah. So right around me. Yeah. Cool. We're both ancient. Yeah. <laughs> ancient. Yeah. Um, how long ago were you doing this? 
That was probably, you know, a year and a half ago or so. And then you've been moving on to this this. Well, I have one student, structures. Casey Messina, who's been working on that project. And then I have other students that have basically, you know, this working on the second generation of these molecules mm -hmm. of other ways how we make them more pre-organized, like sticking intramolecular hydrogen bonds right. or hydrogen bonds within the same molecule. So what are the characteristics of this that's making it really good, like a, a, a nice happy home for an anion? Well, so I could tell you maybe what I'm excited about okay. or why I'm why we use halogen bonds or why we're excited about them. Mm -hmm. So a uh, halogen bond... Um, and these are the halogens. Here. Right. So typically, you know, when we teach sophomore organic chemistry, you think of, of halogens as being electronegative, so they pull electrons towards them. Mm -hmm. That's not the whole story, right? Halogens have lots of electrons that's malleable or polarizable. If you put electron withdrawing groups, you can polarize that electron density around so the halogen. So there's this big squishy cloud of electrons around them. Exactly. So you're not just pulling electrons to one side yeah. of the atom? Yeah, it's hard to quantify the location. Yeah. We can see relative to that original without the electron withdrawing groups that there's an electropositive distal end of the halogen. So okay. we call that this, what we call the sigma hole in the chemistry jargon. And that electropositive region is attracted to negative things or Lewis spaces, things mm -hmm. that have a lot of electron density. That's one of the basis of this halogen bond or this attractive interaction. So why is it cool? Because hydrogen bonds we know are ubiquitous and have myriad important mm -hmm. applications. But a halogen bond is similar to a hydrogen bond, but there's other characteristics. So for instance, because we're dealing with a polarizable atom as your donor, the halogen, we can expect complementarity with really kind of squishy or polarizable Lewis spaces or anions. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that's tough to do with, with hydrogen bonds, right? They, they prefer a tight point charge. And so we can expect some complementarity with large squishy anions. And also the directionality of the interaction is such that <clears throat> wants to be 180 degrees. If you de deviate from 180 de degrees, you get electron pair, electron pair repulsion with the mm -hmm. other electrons around the halogen. And so while the hydrogen bond is very directional, the halogen bond is much more directional. So from a design standpoint, that's really cool because you can say, I want the substrate to bind right there, so I'm going to point my halogen right in that direction. So those are kind right. of the two properties. So this, this like this carbon backbone, you're basically creating that just to right. give these these the two, like, yeah, a place to be, mm -hmm. point them where they where they want to be. For me, that's really that's kind of the fun part of the job. Is okay, we, we get to think about the design of a molecule. What's the best way to, mm -hmm. to orient those two halogens in this particular angle and, and direction? And like this <clears throat> makes sense and is easy. This, like, I guess you kind of know, like, in your head, you've got sort of right. a picture of how it looks. But like, once it starts to fold up, yeah. Well, it's that, a mess. <laughs> and yeah, so unexpected and hard to characterize, but really yeah. kind of it points to the the exciting part, you know, the discovery part of chemistry or, mm -hmm. you know, any science or these serendipitous discoveries that you can then lead to new applications yeah. and new discoveries. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely to me, this feels like organic chemistry. Right. And this feels like you're getting close to how like natural systems create enzymes and catalysts. Mm -hmm. Um, which is very interesting. And it's important to have that link between, you know, it's very simple, we can fully understand hopefully mm -hmm. this process to more complicated and now that can lead us to why these really complicated systems work and right. function as well. And also like, you know, <clears throat> these complicated natural systems, they work very well, sometimes better than anything that we can, like, oh, yeah. are usually better than anything we can do, but they don't have access to all the same tools and intentionality that we have access right. to. It's not like, my body can just throw a chlorine atom into an enzyme. Like, it doesn't have access to chlorine atoms because they're poisonous and they're not hanging out in my body. It's not like a, not a nutrient. Right. Um, whereas you <laughs> totally can. Um, you can. You can incorporate halogens, metals, like all this stuff into, into d doing chemistry that obviously a natural system wouldn't normally, mm -hmm. though there are always exceptions. Weird ones. Yeah. And of course, metals are a very important part of my chemistry because <laughs> uh, of hemoglobin and such. Uh huh. You know, breathing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, I appreciate like, breathing like, these as, days too. As we, like, as we, like, it's very interesting to me because, like, when I studied organic chemistry and I didn't a lot, it felt like there was a very sort of tight distinction between what was being done in organic chemistry and what was being done in biochemistry. <clears throat> and this, this makes me feel, even though it is a cute little molecule, <laughs> That the that line is getting blurrier. Yeah, it is certainly. What else is going on in your lab? Well, you were talking about metals. We are designing ligands to extract, particularly ar arsenate and uranyl, 
from contaminated Bad sources. Stuff. Yeah. Well, that's a very that's a sort of a Montana problem. The arsenic yeah. is the uranium, uh, not so much, but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, turns out you could be rich if you could extract uranium from seawater. Ah, yes, it could be rich if you could <laughs> extract a number of different metals exactly, from seawater. Exactly. <laughs> so, so that's what you're thinking with that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh you need to fund the lab goodness. somehow, right? Oh, I hadn't. I hadn't had that thought. Uh, yeah, that's that's an exciting one. Yeah. Sucking uranium out of seawater. Uh, yeah, so it's three parts per billion, pretty consistent throughout the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot more uranium in the ocean than there is terrestrially. So a number of chemists have gone down the hole of trying to yeah, it's extract not gold from seawater yeah. and how rich they would be if they could do it. Yeah. So it, it, I mean, the Japanese have actually developed processes where they can extract, you know, kilograms of uranium from seawater. It's just cheaper right now to to still uh, mine it. Mm -hmm. There's this sort of ec economic idea that there's a there's no upward limit on the price of gold. It's just whatever the mm -hmm. whatever the demand is. And I'm like, no, the limit is how much it costs <laughs> to extract it from seawater. <laughs> That's right. Like that is how much gold will ever cost. <laughs> it will never cost more than that. It okay. just happens to be more than it currently costs. Yeah. Yeah, somebody should know what that number is, <clears throat> and I don't know that anyone does right now, but there is certainly a number. Wow, and they have extracted kilograms of uranium from seawater. Yeah, over the course of months. Well, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that application. <laughs> what, what else? What other weird things are you going to try to do and blow up the world? We're also working on um, designing oxyanion hole mimics. Sure, which is like a that's like a biochem thing. Yep. So, but looking at it from a small molecule approach. So what I, I mentioned earlier, one of the projects we're working on is developing catalysts or trying to make more efficient organic catalysts. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, if nature does this very well, right, oxyanion holes stabilize negatively charged oxygens mm -hmm. in enzyme active sites through you know, hydrogen bonds, ion pairing, all sorts of things, right? These are high energy states that the enzyme is really good at stabilizing. Mm -hmm. And so we're interested in doing that from a small molecule approach and trying to learn what they do in in enzyme active sites and apply it to small molecules. So basically, and it's the same, you know, similar strategy that we use for, for our other projects. We're, we're designing a molecule and trying to manipulate its interaction with another molecule. So we have a catalyst and we have a substrate. You know, say this is a carbonyl mm -hmm. compound that we're interested in catalyzing. So a carbon-oxygen double bond gotcha. or something containing a carbon-oxygen yeah. double bond. Okay. Energetically, it prefers to bind coplanar with, with whatever we're interacting with. Say it's a hydrogen bonding organocatalyst. What it looks like enzymes do is that they actually bind orthogonal, or, hmm. or so they raise the ground state binding energy of this complex. And so then your, your difference in energy between your high energy transition state and your molecule that you're trying to react is mm -hmm. smaller. So that's what we're trying to do with, with small molecules, is just sterically control how this Right. catalyst interacts with a substrate. So say, nature is good at this, but we can do it with fewer molecules. Or maybe learn- or fewer le atoms. Or maybe, yeah. yeah, we don't expect to be better than nature at yeah. it, but maybe we could do it more, because enzymes active sites could be very specific for a particular mm -hmm. substrate, so maybe we could design a catalyst that would be more broadly applicable to a larger scope of substrates. Um, or we could learn how to do it more efficiently and apply that same principle to other reactions or, or catalysts. Let me know if uh, if you can never extract uranium efficiently from seawater. Uh, I'll be interested in investing forty dollars in that, <laughs> and probably this would probably be a good turnaround. Yeah, from good your turnaround. investment. Yeah, um, that's that's all I got for you though. Um, and I think we'll take that, anything we could get. <laughs> if, I mean, it's interesting. Like, uh, like oftentimes I think of uh, of science being done. At universities, is sort of like we're doing the science because we want to do the science. We want to learn about stuff. We want to maybe this will be a pharmaceutical someday. But I had not thought about the sort of like sea mining applications, which is a much bigger industrial kind of <laughs> right. thing. Awesome. Do you want to meet an animal? Heck yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you brought us what is clearly a, some kind of inorganic compound. <laughs> It's a Pokeball. Oh, <laughs> this is Prickle. It's a Pokeball. <laughs> Did you do that on purpose? <laughs> uh, this is Prickle. She is a pygmy hedgehog. And these guys, you would not find them in the wild. They are kind of a man-made thing. Sure. We like messed around with nature. We were like a little hedgehogs bit. weren't cute enough. Right. And they're like, we want we smaller make them cuter. and cuter and in our homes. Yeah. So they 
They bred the little ones. They, they hybridized them and uh, bred the little ones, and we got this tiny little thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So people have them as pets, and she was purchased as a pet, and they weren't very nice to her. It sounds um, like it's a familiar story at Animal Wonders. Yeah, it Somebody happens. had a pet, and I then they were it. like, this is harder than I thought. Yeah, yeah, oh. we give up. Um, so, yeah, they ended up uh, abandoning her. They told the pet store to board her and then never returned. Mm -hmm. um, the pet store, once they realized she was abandoned, they're like, oh, we should probably pay a little bit more attention to her and um, found that she wasn't eating. Oh, um, what does my finger smell like? Just don't like bite. mealworms? <laughs> <laughs> um, you should probably wash your hands. <laughs> so she... Uh, she has a previously broken leg, so she's a little wobbly, um, and she was super, super skinny when we first got her. Um, I didn't think she was going to make it, but we got her some really fatty wax worms, and she, she fattened up, and she's doing all right now. She's a little smaller than a normal pygmy hedgehog. I think that's just some malnutrition as she grew up, mm -hmm. or it could just be her, and uh, she's doing all right. She's, yeah. she's like, we guess, how, how like long, four and a half. How long have you had her? Um, two years, two and a half years, and... The, I don't know. The pet store just guessed that she was right. two. So we don't. We really don't know how old she is. Um, she was an adult already. Um. <laughs> this, is, this is your favorite. This is how you communicate. Hi, hi. Yeah, <laughs> she's like, I do not like that. Is that, like that. Is that a bad? I want to keep doing. A... It's it's. She's huffing and she's like, I don't like that. I don't like that. <laughs> um, but not. She doesn't like it. She doesn't not like it enough to like right. be really mad. It's more just like, a, come on now, stop it. Do you want Would you like to hold her? Oh, a treat. Yeah, you yeah. Treat? Try. No. Can you get a little bit, get a little bit closer. Oh, sad. Yes. Sad. Yes. Oh, yes. I love mealworms. <laughs> that is good. That is my thing. That is my jam. I love how they eat. <laughs> it's like spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. They have. They don't oh. really have very good molars. They have like a little, a bunch of little sharp dagger teeth. Oh, but come on! Like, quite Finish your food. Quite inefficient. Gross. <laughs> 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 Ew, exoskeleton. Yeah. yeah you, you had a bunch. Why are you I looking just, for more? Yeah. Can somebody <laughs> can somebody peel the next one for me? <laughs> they are going through a vault, so it probably is a, a kind of a thick yeah a thick exos exoskeleton that they have on there. So yeah, so they have these these sharp little dagger teeth. A lot of people think that they're like related to porcupines or rats, and they're not. They are their own little little group. Um, they do not have ever growing teeth. They are related to moles. And uh, okay, they moles. used to be classified in the in, in as an insectivore, like insect insectivore um, group, um, but they have disbanded that and said it doesn't. It's, it's not, really not a, a thing. thing. It's not a thing. So they are reclassifying these guys and and uh, and uh, got to keep on top of it. And I don't remember the word that they belong to now. It's yeah. a longer one, and they made it really complicated. And why? Well, they didn't make it complicated, yeah. Jesse. It is complicated. Yeah, but they didn't have to. They didn't have to name it a complicated oh, yeah. name. They could have called it like, like hedgehogities. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Hedgehoggity. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I would have been happy with that, or moldy, or whatever, whatever. Something cute. Just not like, right. you know, Weird Latin 20 letters long, means something. this like a yeah. bunch of, yeah. Yeah, I gotta be careful with her because these these guys do not understand edges, and uh, we'll she will right wash, walk right <laughs> off my lap. And then uh, they do have an instinct for when they do fall off something, so it, instead of like developing a way to like not walk off a ledge, they developed a way to protect themselves once, they've done once it they do. <laughs> So they'll roll into a ball, and then their their um, quills will cushion the fall. And yeah, I tried to catch one once. How did that feel? It was like that. That was definitely a mistake. Immediate immediate regret, <laughs> and then like two weeks of of prolonged regret. Oh, yeah. It my my hand was like inflamed Got and infection. Yeah, these guys aren't they're, they're not clean at all. Um, would you like to hold her? <laughs> <laughs> So I've heard you're not clean at all. <laughs> they love mm. to um, just get, get as dirty as possible because these quills, they if you, you know if I touch her, it's not like a porcupine. They don't yeah, come they're out. They're not super. Stick. They're not unpleasant to touch. Well, she's also calm. She's a right, she's a quite right. a calm hedgehog. Um, and so you've met a, a different hedgehog, Groucho, named mm -hmm. aptly named. Um, and Groucho would always roll into a ball. And he's really <laughs> pokey, but she's she's quite calm, and so she lays them flat. Even when they are, you know, flexing their muscles and their and their quills crisscross like that, they don't stick. Like they doing? have to try. I think she's just licking you. Just getting into a ball. I just want to be a little. Doing her, Ooh, ow. doing her thing. Um, so in order to like make a predator go away, um, they will roll into a ball and then they'll like jump towards it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even a little poke isn't as bad as like germy poke. 
Right. It's like so, a nice dirty poke. So, does she like your, to smell your finger? She ah. does. Oh yeah, she'll bite you. Don't do that. Uh, are the bar are they barbed? They're not, they're not. And they don't come out at all. So what they'll do is they'll like roll around in their own poop and pee, and then if they find some weird new substance like a, a new plant or, or something like that, they'll go and chew on it and, and uh, just like lick and chew and get their get all this spit and turn into like this froth. And then they'll like arch their back and like spin around and like lick all that frothy spit onto their back. It's called self-anointing. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's getting all that whatever, hopefully toxic substance all over the quill so that when they do poke a predator, they'll, they'll the learn predator a lesson. will be like, boy, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah. Just like you are. My favorite is the tail. Is there a I, tail? I, I usually don't get to see it because, you know, I'm holding her, but yeah. Mary, don't fall. Don't fall. Why are you exploring <laughs> like, I so will. much? I will. <laughs> I want to see the tail. There's nothing there. Okay. There's nothing there. It's a, it's a cute little nub. Here we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's dumb. <laughs> that's a dumb little tail. That it's a little like nubbin. It's doing you any good. Totally a little nubbin. Does it serve any functional purpose? No. Just, no, just, just still there. Just, still just, cute. just there. Damn. Oh, that's the best. Look at his funny mouth. I know, doesn't she? She does that it's little... It's like a fraggle. Uh, and she like does that little sneer almost. Yeah. And cute little claws. <laughs> Look at those things. <laughs> Isn't she silly? All right, she, she'll walk right off your hand, so you have okay. to just keep like, yep. whatever she does. <laughs> it's like, just hold me, guys. Oh. <laughs> so what do you think she feels like when you when you like pet her quills? What does that feel like? Like nothing I've ever felt before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it kind of feels like a like a plastic or like a brush quills. Yeah, sure. Um, it doesn't doesn't. Yeah, it's, it's got not, some resistance to it. Yeah, yeah. and it, it it makes a weird like clicky clacky noise. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, d I found it pleasant, weirdly. Yeah. Like, oh, that's that's a nice that's yeah. a nice feeling. Yeah. Yeah, they have like like about five thousand quills on them, which is impressive. Like, it's more than I got. Yeah. <laughs> what do you find? She is all into the smells today. Yeah. I'm hoping that she finds a new smell and like does her self anointing because that would be really cool. Oh yeah. <laughs> Must be that mealworm in my pocket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or smell something weird, but yeah, her um, it's just her top half that's covered in in the quills. Yeah, it's you just like cute her. soft fuzz on the bottom. Yeah, her little belly's underneath there. Because <laughs> yeah, because yeah, we have to be we have to that. be. It's good to be half soft, half danger. Good to be. I wouldn't. Sure, I wouldn't want to be sure. all danger. I'm soft, but half danger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Half danger is my middle name. But I so here, if you feel feel like go like that and feel like the top, like feel that skin area underneath there. Where are you going? Yeah. Okay. Do you feel like it's like almost a ledge there? <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of that. That's a muscle that you're feeling, oh. um, and it's a it's a big round muscle, kind of like a drawstring bag. Um, so it's like they have a drawstring muscle around, separating their oh, sorry, separating their quills and their um, soft fur, and uh, when they get scared, they can just. You know, tighten that muscle and it closes, closes up the, everything the else soft, up. Yeah, the soft like parts hobble. and the quills show up and the quills <laughs> get pulled taut. Yep. See? Yeah. Well, they get they, they can they can still keep it like relatively. I know, I know. She's so mad. She's like, I don't want to be in a ball. <laughs> I don't want to be mad. <laughs> so they can roll up into a ball like that and protect themselves, but then they can flex their back muscles. Um, and when they do that, then all those quills that are laying flat will actually stand up and mm. then they'll crisscross like this. So they can do several different layers of I'm pissed. <laughs> right. This is layer one. That's layer one. <laughs> like, huff, huff, huff. Oh, you held me in a way I didn't like. Yeah. Mm. Uh, oh, she is just. I love her personality. It's just like. Yeah. You can have a little handful of, of hedgehog. Um, <laughs> she, you know, some hedgehogs can be just really antisocial, and they're just like a, the instincts just completely take over, and they're just like, I don't, I don't want any part of this handling. I'm just gonna stay in a ball the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get hedgehogs that will stay unrolled all the time, and they like they can lay on their back, and you like pet their belly. But she's she's somewhere in between there, where she's like. I love exploring. I'm super curious. You can totally touch me, and I want to be with you, but I'm going to complain about it the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, she's pretty fun. Oh, what, yes. what hedgehog? Uh, so I wanted to talk about, um, these guys are cool because, our hedgehogs are cool, um, not just pygmy hedgehogs, but hedgehogs in general are cool because they actually have an anti-venom property in their blood, in their oh, plasma. Cool. Do so they deal with a lot of snakes? They do, okay. yeah. So vipers are going to come along and you know try and make them a meal, and the vipers, every time they try and attack these guys, they're going to get poked. I also got to say, like, if I'm going to, like, snakes, they eat their prey whole. Yes. 
I feel like this is not a thing I'd want to eat whole. <laughs> if it goes in the right direction. Yeah, I guess. Don't regurgitate think, it, man, though. I tell you what, you can snakes can do things animals shouldn't be able to do. They're so cool. They're so cool. But the, she can do stuff that you can't do. That's absolutely true. She grows quills and she can and put, her, put her nose on her bum. You can't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, I don't have anti-venom yeah. inside of me. Yeah, so that, it's, it's pretty cool. So if like a viper were, or you know, she could even approach a viper if she, if she wanted to. Um, let, let's say that, well, she wouldn't be in the wild. So let's say like a, a, a yeah. wild European hedgehog um, or um, African um, three-toed or something, or four-toed. <laughs> say a, a hedgehog and a viper met and they're like, well, you don't bug me. And the viper's like, well, you bug me and I'm gonna bite you. And you know, they'll, they'll hit their head on the quills. Um, and then every time, you know, the, the, they won't be harmed by it, and then they can actually withstand. They have like 45 times the anti-venom properties of a like a, a regular rodent, another a different kind of rodent, wow. or a rodent. Um, and so they can die from the venom if if it's in the right spot, like right on their face. But um, they they can resist it, and um, then they can actually go and attack the viper and eat the viper. What? Yeah. This? Which is cool. A hedgehog can eat a viper? Yeah. No, a, a, hedgehog. a wild hedgehog's gonna be like like this big. Okay. Yeah. So it's a little a little more formidable, and their t their teeth are bigger, and their mouth is bigger than that. But uh, yeah, they could they could take out a viper, which is cool. Is the coloration the same for most of these pygmy hedgehogs? Um. So humans have done not just like making them smaller and hybridizing them. Um. They've also uh you know uh, capitalized pink. on on uh, mutation uh -huh. um of so colors. Made them all pink and white. Um, so she's not albino. She has some some gray in her quills, and she does not have pink eyes. Um, but some of them will have normal coloration, so they'll be like that mottled brown and black and gray. Um, some can be really dark brown. Some can have spots on them, mm -hmm. like Dalmatian type spots, mm -hmm. and uh, th they can just be. A few of the quills on her head are have a little black brown, yeah. brown stripes. and some of the fur yeah. in there. Yep, um, and she has like one fully gray quill. She's a really light colored one. They have like apricot colors yeah. and like <laughs> salt and pepper and like uh, yeah cinnamon and like all these different color phase you know, color your, mutations. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, the the more weird they are, the more people charge for them. Uh -huh. so. You basically, I, I mean, it like, looks very similar. It it feels like I've got a rat on me because she's it, not. She's, angry about, she's, at you. she's right. not scared and she's not she's upset. She's about with the you. right size and yeah, and she does that feel running feel that thing. Way, yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, rats have five toes and she has four toes. Um, and not rodent. Not yeah, a rodent. also not a rodent. <laughs> Personality-wise, or like kind of how they act is kind of similar to a, a, a big hedge, a big uh, hamster. Yeah, um, like they don't okay. understand edges, and you know they'll randomly bite your finger. Ham hamsters <laughs> don't understand edges. They don't. Okay. Also, they'll that's also good, just fall right off. It's a good thing to know. <laughs> that seems like something that evolution would have taken care of. Unless, unless like you, <laughs> you live, live in the desert the because yeah. that's there where our no hamsters edges. came from. It's true. Yeah. She's just she's such a fun hedgehog. I'm I'm glad that we yeah. were able to take her in and make her feel better and and yeah. that I get to know her. Yeah, I think also like just that one leg. It's not good. It is. So it she's is. A she's a, she's a little. Yeah. She's a little off, and she's getting old. Like we don't know how old she is, and so she is starting to get uh -oh. a little bit weak uh -oh. in her back legs. Uh -oh. <laughs> so they only live like four to seven years, um, and they start showing signs of old age around four. Um, and we think, if she was two, then she's about four and a half. Yeah. So she could be. She could be starting to get old. Um, but come here, you. Yeah, go see mama. Come here. You want to go see? Go and say hi. Here, you, you can have a little handful of hedgehog too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so like, I don't want I don't want to be on my back. Okay. Okay. Fine. <laughs> oh. She's yeah. Like, she's like, she's like, head touch. She's pissed. She's like, don't touch my forehead. See, look at the little grouchy. So, so if you touch right here, you watch her forehead. Yeah, get her mad while I'm holding. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so you see that she has that muscle like there too, and she can yeah. So she has that little part and two parts uh, pieces there, and she can pull it down over her head. Yeah, and it's and cute her because it also face. like makes her eyes get a little narrow. She's like. like <laughs> <laughs> She's got a very dexterous nose. Yeah, it moves a yeah. little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. They're insectivorous. So I can't call her an insectivore. Like, she's not in that group, but she is an insectivore. She yeah. she mainly gets her nutrition from insects, um, but she's also an omnivore, so she's going to eat pretty much whatever she comes across, like a viper, if she wants to. <laughs> okay. um, kind of like a grad student. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so they'll be pulling worms out of the ground, you know, when they you know, early in the morning. I see that too. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, however you can make it work. 
I think it's cool. These guys, like, so I've smelled, have you smelled a worm? Have you, like, you've smelled had Smelled a worm? Yeah. <laughs> No, I That's can't not a say I have. Thing. I mean, I've had worms in my hands, but I don't remember a smell associated with that. Yeah, I mean, I've smelled. They don't smell like anything. They smell like dirt. Um, so I don't think worms smell like anything. Like our our, our yeah. poor human noses don't know what to do with it. But these guys can smell a worm twelve inches under the ground. Um, they do have little claws. They'll wow. dig it right up. They use their little teeth to grab a hold of it and chomp it down. It's not that we're bad at smelling, Jesse. It's just that we're bad at smelling certain things that we don't need to smell, like worms. You're right. You're right. You know, yep, dead things and, and garbage and Super smell good awful. at smelling dead things. <laughs> so good at that. Yeah, these guys are nocturnal, and so, you know, she's, she's super tolerant that. for... I mean, yeah. She's so tolerant for waking up in the middle of her sleep period, you know. But it's not like she has to get to work on time or anything. You know, she can sleep whenever she wants to. She can catch up on it. Yeah. Um, and when, when does uh, dinner happen? Uh, she gets fed every night at about 5.30, and she usually wakes up and eats the best parts and then goes back to sleep, uh -huh. and then uh, wakes sure up again around 10, and yeah. then eats the rest. <laughs> eats uh, some mealworms. Yeah, yep. how many mealworms do you have a day? She gets four a day, and then she gets uh, oh, softened insectivore already, diet. <laughs> about half of your... I know. I know. already today. I mean, yeah. You, get, you get a special day. Special day. Yeah. Snacks, yeah. yeah. They, Extra work. <laughs> Moving around a lot. Look at all that. Yeah. Yeah, and hedgehogs, are, they're cool. They love, they're very active, and they do like running on wheels. Um, she is a major exerciser, and we actually have to restrict her, her wheel time because she will just, like, obsessively run on it. Mm. <laughs> so she, she gets little stints of it a couple times a week, and then... Uh, yeah, if you don't give them a wheel, then they'll you have to give them a big space, and they just run around, they do their thing. Um, a lot of people try and have them as pets, and then they're like, they're super cute, and they'd be fun, and um, then they keep them up all night because they're nocturnal, and if you take their wheel. wheel away, away, squeaky wheel away, then they'll end up like trying to climb the sides of the enclosure, and they're not great climbers, so they'll like climb up and then fall off, so they'll be like, do 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 bump bump like over and over. and So that's often when they'll be rehomed, so we get these guys pretty frequently. I love your little grumpy face, but we're gonna let you go back and and be at peace. You're gonna have one more oh, meal. Worm. Yeah, oh man, I wanted that real bad. That improved my mood like crazy. You're funny little. She kind of reminds me of Scrat, like a little nose. Yeah, that's very cute. Thanks for coming on the show. I forgot your name. Prickle. Prickle. Jesse's got a YouTube channel at animal youtube.com slash animal wonders montana, uh, where you can see. You just making it all work. Lots of different animals. Keeping, having keeping fun. all these folks alive. Yeah, yeah. Um, Orion, thank you for coming on the show and telling me all about <laughs> anion holes um, and and stack and pie stacks. Yeah, I'm just pictured lots and lots of pie. <laughs> so much dinner time. So. I'm glad to I'm glad to have uh, corrected my mental image. And thank you for uh, for watching SciShow for uh, being subscribed. I assume you are. And uh, if you want more of SciShow, we're here, youtube.com slash SciShow.